Good morning, everybody. My name is Lutz Jaitner. I'm a private researcher in a group that is called CP Research Group or Condensed Plasmoids Research Group. Um, with this presentation, I'll give you um, the idea of what we mean with, when we speak about condensed plasmoids. It's an ultra dense state of matter that is found in almost every LENR experiment. Uh, we started with a theory, uh, presented it in 2019, and now we are about uh, doing exp experiments and trying to verify that theory and finding new results. And this presentation will give you a first uh, overview of what we discovered with these experiments. The group consists of eight people. This is all volunteers. Nobody gets a salary or none of us is institutional uh, researcher. Uh, the skill set is quite diverse, which is good. So there are many tasks in front of us which are quite challenging. And I'm very thankful for my colleagues um, that I do not have to do it alone. So um, let me first uh, explain the basic concept of these condensed plasmoids before talking about experiments. So the basic concept is the following. If you have a plasma and you are sending a current through, these plas to, through this plasma, you're getting a so-called plasmoid. It's nothing but a plasma with a current, right? And that, uh, that plasma will build up a magnetic field, and the magnetic field will compress in a Z-pinch structure this plasma into a thin channel. There is a simple formula how large this magnetic field can get. You see that fa uh, formula here on the screen. And the interesting thing is that the radius of this plasma channel the thickness of that channel is in the denominator, which means there is a sing singularity if that radius approaches zero. So potentially, the formula says it could be infinitely strong, the magnetic field. There is no limit from that formula. Of course, there are no singularities in real physics, but the formula says so. Now, the the question is, what will happen in reality? So first of all, we have a vicious cycle or feedback loop, which um, says the following. So if, if there is a magnetic field, it compresses the filament thinner. The thinner filament increases, according to this formula here, the magnetic field that increases the magnetic pressure, so the fil filament becomes even thinner. It's kind of a vicious, vicious circle. It, from a, um, if the starting conditions is uh, a, a current that is high enough and a radius that is small enough, we should expect from that vicious circle a sort of matter collapse. It should, it should collapse to a very thin filament. In um, hot fusion experiments, people try to make it hot by sending very large currents through it. And uh, the, the, the hot plasma has a thermal pressure which will hinder the full collapse. So you will get an equilibrium between the hot matter in this plasma and the magnetic pressure that, that works counter to it. Now, in the condition of cold fusion, or in our experiments, where these uh, filaments are, I would say, thin enough and not having currents larger than a few thousand amps, there is radiation cool cooling. The uh, filament will cool down, and the thermal pressure will go away very quickly. So. The only limit here, and this is probably the next thing. Oh yeah, it, it says it already. 
So the collapse is only limited by quantum mechanics. You cannot squeeze electrons into an infinitely thin uh, channel without increasing their um, kinetic energy. So that is the limit of this thing. Please refer to uh, this link here. I published in 2019 the full theory. That is a thick document with almost 100 pages. It gives you all the details. This, uh, this, this basic idea can be modeled quantum mechanically. So we know precisely or relatively precisely how these objects look like, what the density is that is resulting from this collapse, what the current is, uh, is looking, the, um, the, uh, the current density we are achieving and so forth. Um, the outcome is the, ma the matter is getting so dense that you'll see fusion by tunneling. If the, the nuclei can come close enough, there is a tunneling effect. And also there is a high level of electron screening because the matter is up to 100,000 times uh, denser than normal matter. So this is not <coughs> the thing that you know. This is a novel ultra-dense state of matter. It's something very, very special. Uh, this is a brief uh, schematics how it looks like. So it's a plasma filament which we call the core. Uh, the, the computation says there is an excess of negative charge, let's say 2% or so more negative charges in the core. So you need some positive ions from the outside to compensate the charge. And this is like a double layer. So there is a strong electric field between the halo, this, this outer layer of ions, and the plasma filament. Um, this this um, electric field is responsible for ionizing matter. If that, that thing comes in contact with surfaces, you see uh, very special traces occurring, and it's an ionization. So the, uh, the, the plasma interacts with the, with the surface and leaving tracks. The uh, matter density is high enough in the core that all the electrons are delocalized. So they are no longer atoms. They can freely move. And the electrons move all in the same direction because a current is flowing through that is high enough. It, it carries all the electrons. There can be a current also in the halo which is either in the same or in the opposite direction, depending on the electric field that, the, that you put on this object. I explained that already. So here is what we do to create these objects. We were using a low pressure gas discharge with relatively high voltages, like 2000 volts or 2300 volts, and we were, we were pulsing the voltage. So it, we, we need a high voltage power supply and a switch to have pulse DC high voltage. And the current can be up to 400 amps. It does not have to be, but that is the maximum the electronics can, can do. The pulse rate is fully programmable, which gives interesting effects. So if you have a... Uh, high frequency, you see special things. The pulse duration is, I think, up to 5 microseconds, 0.1 to 5 microseconds, in that order. At least for the experiments that we did. It's freely programmable. There is no, no technical limit except for the mean power. The power, the power supply limited, limits the whole thing to 300 watts. We are actually developing a second generation one that will allow us uh, with uh, three power supplies to support eight kilowatts in the experiment. By the way, if you are interested in this kind of experiment, we are willing to produce the electronics such that you can buy these um, 
switched mode, high voltage supplies. Uh, how, how are we sure that the objects that the theory um, is describing are really created in our experiments? There are many ways to, to see that. And I give you just this example as an evidence because it's very clear. So when we look at the surfaces of the electrodes, we find <coughs> many strange tracks and one, of, one type of these tracks is ring-shaped um, imprints. These four photos are not from us, but from other research groups. And you see them typically in LENR experiments. They show up frequently. So we are sure we, we have the same thing in our apparatus. This is one of the evidences. Um, be aware that there are many other possible uh, shapes and look into uh, my, my um, main article to see examples of that. It's very interesting stuff. And look into your own LENR experiments to see whether you find similar tracks because that is an indication of condensed plasmoids. And then you see the connection of what I'm presenting to you now to what you do da daily. If you don't look through the microscope, you won't see the connection. <coughs> what are the experimental findings? So the first thing I have to say is every pulse that we send through, if it has a high voltage, high enough voltage, and high enough um, energy, is creating CPs, at least one, sometimes several. So the rep reproducibility is 100%. It works immediately. It takes only a microsecond before that object is created. Now, the next question is, how long do they live? What do they do? How much fusion they create? But the first step is to create this intermediate state or object that is then the catalyst for the, for the subsequent fusion. So this intermediate state can be uh, created with 100% reproducibility. Now, how do we do that? How do we know this? The thing is, we focused on electrical measurements. So we know electrically that these objects exist by watching the uh, conductivity of the channel. When we start the high voltage, only milliamps are flowing because we have a glow discharge at very low pressure, let's say one millibar, and that is conducting very pu poorly because it's a thin gas. But then all over a sudden, the impedance of that thing changes dramatically, and we see a discharge path with less than one ohm resistance. And this path is then able to carry kiloamps, if you want, and we can, uh, by, by, by measuring the um, current rise time, we can determine the inductance, which is higher than a piece of wire would have. So that is an indication for the very small radius of these ob objects. It is not necessarily a straight path. It can be like a corkscrew or some more complicated paths. We don't know yet. So the inductance is another indication of that something very special is present. Uh, this path we have uh, seen remains after the pulse, which is very strange. So you would expect from a normal glow discharge uh, uh, plasma <coughs> that it decays in a few microseconds and no longer conducts after your, your current stops through the electrodes. What we in fact see is a conductive path after 60, up to 60 milliseconds. And I would suspect that uh, that can be extended further. Other researchers have seen lifetimes of condensed plasmoids up to several days. So these objects are quite stable, not stable from an energetic standpoint, but from a dynamic standpoint. So if you have nuclear energy feeding into this object, 
it can uh, self-sustain itself up to days. These are very strange phenomenon, very novel, and we see it in our experiments. So it is something we predicted, we see it, so we are, we are sure we, we have the objects that we want to have. Um, interestingly, when we reverse the current through this path, the object immediately destroys itself, which is an indication that the magnetic pressure is needed to, uh, to maintain the phenomenon. If that current is going in the wrong direction, poof, it's gone. We can achieve these objects with all sorts of gases. No matter what we put in, it works. But the lifetime very much depends on the nuclear quality of this gas. I give you examples. If we do this with argon, we see the effect of low resistance, uh, high impedance, uh, high um, inductance, but it dies immediately, uh, immediately after the pulse. It's gone. Uh, if we do this with uh, air, which is mostly nitrogen, we see a extended lifetime. So we, we, are, we suspect that nitrogen is a nuclear fuel. We will in the future be able to do that with pure nitrogen to be sure that not moist or any, any other effect is, is causing this. When we do this with water vapor, the lifetime is way extended beyond what nitrogen sh uh, shows. And the best results are with heavy water. And we experimented with lots of other gases and even electrode materials. And we can qualify how good they are as a nuclear fuel. And we, we, we uh, learned a lot about that. So we, we have a good good feeling for the nuclear fuel we want to use if we commercialize that. Okay, uh, one of the most uh, interesting things here is that LENR seems to be possible without hydrogen and even without metals. So we tried electrode materials uh, that are ceramic or at least not containing any metal. <laughs> And we still see LENR. We still see this uh, lifetime extension. And air as a gas is also not uh, a hydrogen. So I would say this is something that probably most of the LENR researchers would not expect. That without hydrogen and without metal, you still have LENR. But we are sure about that. Now, these stars that you now see behind the uh, lines here is something, these results came not surprising to us. We predicted them in 2019, which is quite nice. So the theory that was originally just a theory now tries to, um, uh, now sees confirmation. With each experiment that we are doing, we are coming closer to validating this theory. Therefore, I would think that after 35 years of LENR research, um, we are in a phase that we have to rethink about our underlying paradigms, what we believe, what our working um, assumptions are about LENR needs to be revisited. Most, most uh, researchers believe they need a metallic lattice to see the effect. This is one of the beliefs. Another working assumption is that LENR is only happening at the surface, which motivates the use of nanopowders and, and things like that, or thin film structures or whatever. Another working belief is that the helium-4 that is showing up in the experiments comes from DD fusion. Each of these working assumptions have a grain of truth, but actually as a generalized, generalized assumption, I think 
or we believe it is incorrect. It is not describing um, the, uh, the reality correctly. So if you optimize your experiment and your, your device that you're working on, based on these assumptions, you will be probably disappointed by the reliability of what comes out. Uh, we see also in publications of other people increasing amount of evidence that plasma is needed or plasmoids are needed to start the reaction, at least as a trigger. So the subsequent fusion is another animal, but the, the immediate state that catalyzes the fusion needs to be created and maintained before anything else can happen. Did you know that LENR can happen in low pressure gases? I guess you know because I presented that to you, but were you aware of that? Are you aware that helium-4 can be created by a vast variety of LENR reactions other than DD? The example that I want to use here is if you bring lithium and hydrogen together, no matter whether it's proteum or deuterium, and you let that fuse, you're getting helium as well, right? So I know dozens of re reactions that create helium by fusion. So that is not an, uh, not an unusual thing to create helium. It's, it, it's, it comes out as an al alpha particle. Why are people so focused on DD fusion? It is not so obvious that this is the right assumption. Um, are you aware that palladium deuteroid, deuteroid is containing a plasma? So if the, den if the loading factor is high enough, the deuterons in, in palladium are very highly mobile. They can move if you apply an electric field. The electrons are also highly mobile in that thing. So you have a little plasma in the metal. You don't see it, but it's there. Now what would happen if you apply a current? My guess is you see the same sort of condensation of these plasmoids that we see in the gas phase. So what we present is not specific to gases. It, it is applicable to palladium and, the next bullet says it, also to a nickel surface. So nickel is specific that it um, absorbs hydro hydrogen, splits it into ions, and all the protons are on the surface. They are highly mobile. That's why this is such a good c catalyst in chemistry. And the electrons, of course, are also mobile. So if you apply a current um, in parallel to the surface, you would expect condensation as well. So now the last two bullets may sound very speculative to you, right? It, it is something you, you probably are confronted, confronted with for the first time now. So it sounds speculative. But here is the rub. Other experiments confirm, seem to confirm what I say. So this is from Edward Storms. I think that is from 2024 or 23. Um, he was using a strip of palladium that was gas, gas loaded with deuterium. And instead of just letting it um, create heat by itself, he was also sending a current through the metal. Yeah, it's a poster. It's from a poster. Yeah, so I found that very revealing. He shows that um, with a quadratic um, dependency on the current, he sees an in in enhancement of the nuclear reactions. So it is indeed very beneficial to have a current flowing through the palladium deuteride to see the reaction. 
So if you're doing experiments with palladium deuteride, please try. Please use a current, preferably a short pulse with high current through the material and be sure that you're sending the pulse uh, at, at one time in this direction and, at, and in the next time in the other direction. So you exclude um, electromigration. The normal explanation of this effect is, oh, we have electromigration and then at certain points we have an accumulation of deuterium and that's the pseudo explanation. This explanation is wrong. So if you do it bang and then bang, the uh, migration will um, neutralize each other, but the effect still remains. Please try that out. It is very, very interesting. And I have seen a lot of other ex uh, experiments that confirm this effect. So I, I leave you here with the sentence, there is no LENR without plasma. And I'm opening here for questions. So thank you very much. You know, in preparing this uh, workshop, I made a, an effort to arrange such a session about plasmas. Uh, and uh, as a, for sure, you know, as this is the early morning uh, speech, which should uh, wake up you all of, wake up all of you. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, go ahead. To? Okay. Yeah, hello. Uh, thank you for the presentation. It's all very interesting, but I'm a little bit perplexed because I don't understand how theory connects with the experiment because the measurements of your device that you're presented are electrical measurements, which my experience with uh, electrical discharges of various kinds, they are consistent with an arc discharge just transition from a glow discharge to an arc discharge. That's why resistance goes down. I don't understand how this connects with the condensed plasmoids. So the, I, I, don't, I don't get the connection. I mean, how is your device connected with the generation of plasmoids, which then show up in other experiments? This is, I, I did not understand. So I try to give you an example, which is the tracks that we see on the surface of our electrodes. So we okay. see lots of um, circular and other shapes, traces, okay. which otherwise glow discharge would not produce these. Um, I'm talking about arc discharge, not glow. Well, arcing discharge is creating CPs. So this is okay. maybe where the confusion comes. The, usually under, the usual understanding is there is a distinction between glow discharge and arcing or sparking in vacuum. Uh -huh. okay. Now, once you have the sparking or arcing, yeah. you are in the mode that we are using and you are creating CPs without knowing it. So CPs has always been always been there in, in arc discharge when they transition to arc course yes. all the time in all this our technology. My, this okay. is my assumption. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Lutz. Excellent speech. I will second that you need to have exotic vacuum objects formed for any Lena. Have you considered that the persistent Glory. conductive path that you observed is the very same etheric matter streams that Tesla described when exploring high tension, unidirectional, disruptive discharges. I don't know what that is, sorry. So it's described in the works of Tesla that when he does high tension discharges, the things that would create CPs in your terminology, uh, it would leave behind a, a, a stream in the environment. So obviously you haven't considered. Um, second, you, you talked about um, on the surfaces um, in Matsumoto's 1990 work, Palladium Deuterium Electrolysis, he saw crystal grain boundaries start to form CPs and consume the crystal grains and transmute the matter inside the electrode. 
And then lastly, Norris Piri used... Uh, what was the question? This the, was stating it, it's, something. It's a, su it's a support. It's a support. So uh, it's, have you, were you aware of that? So to speak, yes. Okay. Yeah. Were you aware of Norris Piri, the late Norris Piri, and the late Matsumoto? Uh, he used palladium deuteride, uh, deuterium loaded palladium, and he used a microwave chamber and a microwave will create the current when the conductor spans a wavelength, and he produced many, many elements in those experiments. It's what you were talking to when you pass a current through a... I'm probably loaded. not aware of that, no. Okay, so I can share all of the details. So you have to Thank discuss you. that together. Yes. Thank you. Okay. But may I? Uh, yeah. My time? Yeah. Okay, so uh, you told that uh, hair is a good candidate to get plasmoid, and, uh, but you have, uh, I think he is correct, but we have to consider that in the air there is always water, it means hydrogen. So we have to consider this fact. Yeah. The, in the air, always water, and then I, I, hydrogen. I know, so, yeah. Okay, so, so, so my point is the following. Um, the uh, hydrogen content in the, in the normal air is low enough that the uh, probability that two hydrogen atoms are fusing is, is reduced compared to pure hydrogen. And okay. we would like but to verify what we think by using dry uh, and pure nitrogen, we would expect the same uh, strength of, of longevity. But that is still... Um, to do. We haven't done it. We are a private group. We have limited resources and time. <laughs> Next. Yes, Anatoly Klimov is uh, with us. Anatoly, please. Uh, thank you uh, for your presentation. Uh, my question concerning your large lifetime of your plasmoid. You talked about uh, uh, typical lifetime is about 60 millis Second, what means uh, this uh, 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 lifetime? Uh, what's your measure? Uh, how to observe that uh, the plasmoids exist during this time? Thank you for the question. I probably haven't explained clearly what we, what we measured. So we observe that the conductive channel stays conductive for 60 milliseconds. So we are able to send a current through and still see this uh, low resistance of less than one ohm. Uh, if you, if you, uh, I understand, uh, understand you, uh, the uh, resistivity of the plasma uh, uh, consists uh, through, through this, namely through this time period, correct? I didn't get you correctly, sorry. Uh, uh, you measure uh, a conductivity of plasma during this time period. Yes, uh, plasma stays conductive during 60 milliseconds, yes. You measure the resistance. Uh, and uh, and uh, my second uh, question concerning to the uh, trace on the surface Your voice is breaking, sorry. Uh, uh. So I suggest, and Anatoly, you keep in touch with uh, Lutz uh, later on, because for sure there are, this is a quite uh, uh, mind-shaking uh, presentation, so you know we are not going to, to answer all questions now. Maybe a last one. Uh, okay, my, on. my question is, uh, <laughs> no. I always oh. waiting as well. Okay. Yes, quickly. Uh, thank <laughs> you for your great uh, disruptive work, far from the main uh, post Fletchman way, you know, the way you use the way. Uh, you mentioned the need uh, to improve the effect of uh, current flowing the film, you know. And uh, I tried to, to make a link with uh, the presentation from uh, Dimitar Alexandrov, by which he used uh, also uh, current to, to hit directly his constant wire. And I suggested, suge sorry, I suggested yesterday to him to check first of all if effectively the current could have an impact with uh, his excess heat. And last point, 
uh, Romanian uh, Dan Chica already have uh, wrote a great paper a great student in the same way uh, to relate the influence uh, of uh, current uh, across a very fine film of palladium deposited by Spotting, you know. And uh, more thinner was the film, more higher uh, uh, was the excess heat, you know. What exactly is the question? Probably no, I no, didn't it's understand not a status. It's just it's a comment. A, yes, a status. Oh, okay, thank you. No okay, okay. Maybe very, very short. Thank you. No. So uh, I am wondering a little bit about your predictions because you didn't uh, sh uh, show us, you know, any estimation of the temperature or density in, in the plasma you have uh, produced. So how you can um, explain, you know, some nuclear reactions? You need for that, you know, uh, some data of, of temperature, of density, everything, um, because it is necessary if you want to calculate, you know, alpha production you said in uh, using nitrogen, you know, how large is the Coulomb barrier there? So how is uh, difficult to tunnel that, you know, there's not so, so this kind of, um, Phenomena unknown, you know, this secular uh, ring shaped uh, um, uh, objects, yeah, that is uh, in condensed matter already known. And this, uh, in my opinion, there is a kind of, uh, you know, high density energy production that you can use for everything. So the question is if you want to show this something important for low energy nuclear reactions, you should have. Um, energy density, you should, um, you should measure the temperature, and then you can model nuclear reactions, okay? Because there's a, another Why point Why temperature? Is because of kinetic energy? No, temperature is kinetic energy. Right. Okay, yeah, and so this is uh, what is important if you want to have a, any kind of, of predictions, okay? Yeah. Otherwise, uh, you see something, some objects, but you cannot uh, explain that. The question is, what Fair is enough. the coupling between some atomic effects? So this ring-shaped uh, um, uh, discharges, or there is a kind of uh, solitons, you know, that are um, going there, uh, how they can couple, you know, to individual atoms. I, so this I, I not, get not your so point, easy. Conrad. May I comment? So. Uh, I'm fully with you, except for the point of the uh, temperature. So we are at the beginning of a discovery experimentally. We are not publication ready. We know all the missing things that we have to do, things like um, determining the, um, the nuclear ash, for example, determining the plasma temperature, very many things that we have to measure. I'm fully aware of that. We're not institutional scientists which uh, first do everything perfect and then publish. This is the first uh, public mentioning of our, our, our research um, results. So I, I fully agree with you. And then the, the temperature thing is something where I disagree. I think the meta density in these objects calculated by my uh, computer simulation is high enough to see fusion by tunneling instead of by kinetic impact. And this is where our research deviates from your research. I understand where, where you have a disconnect, but I, I don't agree with you. No, yeah, you have always tunneling. You have no other effects, you know. So this only, we can discuss it later on. You know, I think so. Problem. It's worth But uh, uh, Indeed, I, I see that uh, it was an interesting discussion. It's not the end of it, for sure. So you will have to keep in touch with... Uh, I would love to. Uh, well, we are just late, so... Uh, we will uh, very short. Uh, no, no. What is the capacitance? The what? The capacitance. You only mentioned the capacitance resistance you and... You mentioned the inductance of the plasma, not the oh, capacitance. Oh, the uh, capacitance of the CP, you mean? Yeah. Against what? A capacitor contains of two conductors. <laughs> Yeah, well, you, you have a separation of charges. Yeah. Oh, you mean in the uh, d uh, double layer? Yes. I didn't compute. I can try to, but I, I don't know. You have to work together. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you.